Hello, this video is sponsored by Wondrium. I'm Lawrence Brown and I'm on a quest to uncover all of the memos that Britain and America lost in the pond and one of those memos pertains to words, specifically American English words that I, a British person who's lived in the United States for over 14 years, use every day. Just in sentences that are better constructed than that one. In previous videos in this series, we've seen that I now use words like cookie or thumbtack, not usually in the same sentence. Or meal. If you would like to keep up with this series, as well as other things that I talk about, and you're not subscribed to Lost in the Pond, then do that now! Well, in the third instalment of this incredibly lucrative franchise, I now bring you 12 more. And in one particular case, we're talking about words that I only just realised I was using within the last week. And so, without further ado, here are 12 American English words that I now use every day, part 3. Ah, I'll never forget when I first learned about this one. Ground beef, which, because we don't call it that in England, I just thought this was beef that you found on the ground which can't be good for hygiene, and it turns out that's not what it is. Ground beef is the stuff you get in those white plastic trays with the plastic film on it, and you basically use it to make beef burgers or beef patties. In the UK, I'd always known this as minced beef, because, you know, it's minced up into little bits of meat, you know, and I suppose the same is true of the word ground, as in ground coffee. It's essentially the same thing, just, you know, without the caffeine, the liquid form, and the ability to easily be transferred into a mug. It's nothing like coffee, but ground beef. I use that term all the time now. Ah oh yeah, zip code, once again, falls under those words that you use all the time, because you're always giving people your address, you know. I mean, I'm not going to give it out online, again, but people need your zip code or you need their zip code in order to send them stuff. Or in the case of working in call centers, like I did in the first few years of living in the United States, you have to ask about a hundred strangers a day what their zip code is. And so you just end up saying the phrase, but in the United Kingdom, I always knew this as postcode or postal code. Zucchini, a squash and also sounds like something that a Jawa would say in Star Wars. I'm not the biggest fan of this food, but it always makes its way into our house about this time of year, probably because of, you know, harvest festivals and stuff. And it makes its way into soups. So we have zucchini soup. And of course, to communicate this with my wife and other people that might eat slash drink the soup, you have to say that word, zucchini. But of course, that's not what I knew in Britain. The word I knew was courgette. But that could easily be confused with the name of a famous American car. So we can't use that here. I mean, that's not the reason, but that's, that's personally my reason. When I moved to the United States, part of the deal was that I'd get a new mum because I'm married into an American family, so a mom-in-law, right? And so now, whenever I'm in conversation with my wife about my mother-in-law, aka her mom, I find myself referring to her as your mom. There was a long phase when I just said your mom, then I moved on to your mam, and then your mom. It's like I'm going through all of the vowels. So soon it'll be your mem, and then your mim. Both of those sound weird, so hopefully that doesn't transpire. Ah, we've all done it, haven't we? We've all been in conversations where we receive unsolicited advice, and we've also often given it ourselves, or at least I have. And when I do that, usually in the old days, I would have given my tuppence worth. <laughs> but we don't have tuppence here. Here, I found myself, just because everybody else sort of uses this phrase, saying, I'm giving my two cents. And to be fair, cents are still in circulation in the United States, so it makes sense. That Don't laugh at that. Please don't laugh at that. A lot of the American English words that I habitually use seem to pertain to driving, because even as a passenger in the car, I still have to read off directions if the GPS isn't working because we're in West Virginia, and sometimes that will involve saying certain things pertaining to the road and one of those things is stoplight. I mean that's just something that we always have to do, everybody has to do it, is stop at a stoplight and then it changes and you go. I think we all know how stoplights work. It's just that until a few years ago I didn't call them stoplights, I called them traffic lights because that's just what we use in England and I understand in parts of the US you'll sometimes hear that and so there are regional differences over what you call a stoplight but here in this part of the world it seems like stoplight is the big thing. This one is sort of niche to my job as a YouTube sensation, so I wouldn't ordinarily have used this much. But even though, contrary to popular belief, I don't actually script most of my videos, when I do, I have on occasion been known to use a teleprompter. But in the UK, if I were to have done this, I probably wouldn't have referred to it thus. Instead, we typically call the thing that feeds you your lines an auto cue. 
because it cues you automatically, but then it also prompts you televisually. So I can see the argument for both words. What was I saying a moment ago about driving terminology? Well, it never ceases to be true, and interstate is one of those words that I just wouldn't have used in Britain. A near equivalent to this, as well as freeway, would perhaps be motorway. But it feels sort of weird to use the term motorway in the US, especially since a person told me once, and I'm not sure how true this is, that in America a motorway sounds as if it is a road exclusively for motorcycles. That doesn't make any sense to me either, just because, you know, a car is a motor vehicle, so it belongs on this road as well. But anyway, while we're on the subject of things that get you from A to B, let's talk about this. Sometimes when visiting West Virginia, it's actually a good thing to go off the grid, especially when navigating the world-famous Appalachian Trail. This week, I've been learning all about it in the fantastic Wondrium series, America's Great Trails. Something I didn't realise is that the trail is so expansive it passes through nearly a third of all states in the Union. Absolutely mind-blowing. And, you know, watching the series, my brain did two things. It learned a lot of stuff, which in itself feels remarkable after researching and talking about America myself for the past seven years, but it also went, Lawrence, go and dig out your hiking boots. We're going to emulate Australian journalist and host Mick Davey and hike America's great trails, but, you know, after the winter is done. And I'd say that this sort of thing happens to me regularly while experiencing Wondrium's courses, which is why I'm looking forward to sitting down with one of Wondrium's new releases, The US Constitution Through History, a detailed series that takes you through 230 years of discussion and debates. Basically, Wondrium is where you find the answer to everything you've ever wondered about and some things you never imagined you'd wonder about. Their carefully curated collection of short form and long form videos, tutorials, how to's, travelogues, documentaries, and more is academically comprehensive, thoroughly researched, relentless entertaining and presented by engaging experts who know way more than me. As we approach the holidays, a Wondrium subscription would be the perfect gift for people that, you know, like to use their brains. And as it happens, they're giving my viewers the fantastic offer of a free trial. So why not show your support for my show by subscribing to Wondrium today? Visit wondrium.com slash lost in the pond right now to begin your free trial. The link is in my description below. This one hit me like a ton of bricks the other day because fellow YouTube sensation Hank Green asked a question on Twitter and that question was, is there anything that if you turn it upside down is no longer the same thing? And me thinking I was being absolutely hilarious but also factual answered with exclamation points in Spanish. And it was only after I'd posted it that I realised I'd written exclamation points instead of exclamation marks. And that's before we even get to the debate over whether to have exclamation points inside the brackets or not. Americans' brackets are parentheses. I don't know how this one ended up in here because I haven't been given a hickey since New Year's Eve 2007. But it came up in conversation recently with my wife, who coincidentally was at that New Year's party. And we both used the word hickey. I mean, of course she would. She's American. I shouldn't because I'm not. Although I might have heard it in films. I just know that the previous time I was given a hickey, which was March 1998, I was calling it a love bite because that's what people in my neck of the woods of Grimsby seem to call it. And it's been so long since I've used that term that I genuinely had to look it up this morning. Can't imagine what the CIA thinks of my search history. I think it was part one in this series when I told you that I use the word trash every single day and that's because I take out the trash and you can't just leave it in the parking lot again because you'll get fined. Sometimes depending on where you live you might have to put it in a dumpster so that it can be taken away. Well for some reason and it could be that for the most part while living in the United States I've put my trash into wheelie bins or wheelie trash cans I don't know what they call them instead of a dumpster but now that we use a dumpster I found myself referring to it as a dumpster instead of a skip. Yes, in Britain we call a dumpster a skip and to this day I've no idea why. Ah yes, and why not finish with something that at this time of year is popular in both Britain and America, it's just that it goes by a marginally different name. I'm off added sugar this year but in every year prior to this one my wife and I would partake in candied apples and as the years go by you sort of forget that you used to call these a different thing. When I lived in England these were known as toffee apples. And I don't know, I feel like if I use that term here, Americans would mostly know what I mean. But I don't. I now instinctively use candy apple, or if I'm feeling particularly adventurous, candied apple. Which is a little bit more of a mouthful, especially if... No, I did that joke recently. 
That's it for this video. Americans, let me know in the comments below if there are any British words that you use every day. I'm Lawrence Brown. You can follow me on Twitter at Lost in the Pond US, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel so that I don't have to. These videos have only been able to get better because of the support of my patrons. If you would like to support Lost in the Pond, you can do that today at patreon.com slash lost in the pond. Until the next video, goodbye.